Hey guys, today I'll show you a horror TV series named Black Mirror Season 4. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The first story, titled USS Callister, takes place aboard a spaceship called the Callister. The captain of the spaceship makes his entrance. At this moment, the crew reports that a powerful enemy battleship is approaching. The terrifying vessel appears on the main screen with menacing intent. Crew member Walton believes they have no chance of winning and suggests surrendering. However, the captain remains remarkably calm. As the enemy ship opens fire, it seems the protective shield won't hold much longer. The spaceship suffers severe damage. At this critical moment, the captain decides to charge at full speed into a nearby asteroid belt. This move increases the photon machine gun power of their own ship. The plan succeeds, and following the captain's order, they open fire. The enemy ship suffers a devastating blow. The villainous one-eyed leader manages to steal an important crystal. Despite the captain's demands, the enemy refuses to hand it over. So, the captain issues an order, and the Avatar girl operates the weapons. The enemy ship is blasted into pieces while the one-eyed leader escapes in a pod with the crystal. The men celebrate, and the women embrace the victorious captain, showering him with kisses. His delight is beyond words. Suddenly, the scene shifts to reality. The triumphant captain is a disheveled and sleazy middle-aged man named Robert. He works at a high-tech gaming company called Callister. The beautiful receptionist is the same avatar girl from earlier. Many users recline in chairs, experiencing an immersive space fleet game. All they need to do is implant a device on their temple, somewhat similar to VR. The spaceship's crew members in the real world are his co-workers. Walton, the crew member from before, is the company's CEO, and Robert is the chief programmer. He is a quiet and introverted person who doesn't quite fit in with his colleagues. A young woman enters, claiming to be a new employee. She admires Robert's game design and has joined the company because of it. She's a devoted fan. Robert's workspace is filled with sci-fi movies and collectible toys related to space travel. The two kindred spirits chat happily when CEO Walton comes to ask when the game will be updated, as the users are getting impatient. Faced with the assertive boss, Robert meekly agrees. Before leaving, Walton takes notice of the eager newcomer, Cole, and introduces himself. He invites her to tour the company, causing Robert to feel discontent with Walton's actions. Consequently, he's distracted while discussing a game update with his colleague, setting the release date for Christmas Eve. Robert lives in apartment 402, and his home is filled with models, revealing his passion for all things space-related. Eagerly shedding his outerwear and accessories, he implants a high-tech device on his temple and double-clicks the Space Fleet game icon on the screen. The device begins transmitting, and he quickly enters the game world. All the crew members are his co-workers. Since Walton has snatched away Robert's female fan in real life, the timid man can only seek revenge in this virtual world. Here, Robert is an almighty figure. He grabs Walton by the collar and lifts him up like an adult toy as the other crew members look on in fear. After venting his anger, the captain doesn't forget to give Walton a kick in the rear. The frustrations he endures in the company are released within the game world, and he can now log out of the game. However, in reality, CEO Walton still frequently visits Cole to inquire about her well-being. It seems like a parallel universe. Robert is, of course, not happy about this. Cole goes to make coffee and learns from her co-worker that Walton is a playboy. Cole says she came to the company solely because she admires Robert. Listening from a hidden spot, Robert secretly rejoices. The co-worker asks Cole if she's in love with him, but she explains she only admires him. The eavesdropping Robert turns serious. After work, everyone leaves the office, but Robert secretly puts on white gloves and goes to Cole's workstation. He retrieves her coffee cup from the trash and carefully places the lid in a prepared plastic bag. Back home, he extracts DNA from the lid using a cotton swab, puts the swab in a dish, and places it into a device. He stores the used lid in his mini-fridge. The progress bar on his computer slowly advances, with an estimated completion time of 16 hours. The device runs on its own as Robert sleeps like a pig. When he wakes up, more than half the progress has been made, with nine hours remaining. He returns to work while the computer continues running at home. His eyes are glued to Cole as the progress reaches finally 100%. At this moment, Cole opens her eyes. However, her hairstyle and outfit have changed. The cabin door opens and she feels apprehensive, cautiously exploring her surroundings. Looking through the window, she realizes she's on the Callister spaceship in the vast universe. Arriving at the cockpit, the other crew members warmly greet the newcomer. Cole finds that her real-life co-workers don't recognize her at all. 
The crew members tell her she's on the captain's spaceship in an exclusive offline game made by the company. They are all clones created from DNA samples collected through various means. The DNA reading device is one of Robert's inventions. In other words, there's another version of her in the real world, similar to a parallel universe. Everyone here has angered Robert in reality, and they are trapped here forever, unable to die. When Robert arrives, everyone nervously takes their places, except for Cole, who struggles to accept her new reality. She runs out, desperately trying to break the cabin door to escape, but finds herself surrounded by a golden light. She thinks she might be vanishing, but she's teleported back to the cockpit instead. Robert orders her to return to her position, but she refuses, angering him. He raises his hand and with a gesture, she becomes faceless, unable to see or breathe, writhing in pain on the floor. Cole has no choice but to comply, and her features return. She nervously returns to her workstation and starts working. They discover the one-eyed villain's whereabouts on a desolate planet. Leaving one crew member behind to watch the ship, the others follow the captain, teleporting to the barren world. Cole takes advantage of the captain's distraction to suggest shooting the captain, but the crew member tells her the gun is a mere prop and that Robert is invincible here. The one-eyed villain appears, and after a standoff with Robert, summons a pet monster that terrifies the crew. At this critical moment, Robert's tablet rings. It's the pizza delivery guy. He has no choice but to pause the game and return to reality to get his pizza. Everyone breathed a sigh of relief, and even the monstrous beast lay down to rest like a little kitten. The one-eyed villain put down his massive weapon. It turned out that everyone had been acting along with Robert. The Beast and the One-Eyed Villain were once co-workers of Robert, transformed this way because they had offended him. Meanwhile, Robert received his pizza and quickly devoured it. The captain was about to return, so everyone hurried back to their positions, striking a pose and preparing to continue their performance. Robert returned and used a diversionary tactic. The One-Eyed Villain cooperated and deliberately fell into the trap. He was soon shot and fell from the mountain. The crew members applauded louder than fireworks. The one-eyed villain pleaded with Robert to finish him off, but the cold-hearted Robert refused and ordered him imprisoned. The villain truly couldn't live or die as he wished. It was time for Cole to give the captain a kiss, but she adamantly refused and slapped him instead. Robert waved his hand, preparing to use his power. However, he ultimately showed mercy, forgave Cole, and exited the game. The captain finally left. The other crew members urged her to be more obedient and shared with her that Robert didn't use his tongue when kissing. Walton then took off his pants, revealing that everyone here, regardless of age or gender, lacked reproductive organs and excretory systems. Cole was furious and determined to fight back. The others quickly tried to dissuade her, reminding her that Robert was in God mode. The only way was to get his tablet and contact the outside world. However, the tablet disappeared whenever he left. Cole then discovered that she could send an invitation to her real self to join the game. Her real self successfully received the invitation, but the cloned Cole had overestimated her intelligence. The real Cole told Robert about the message, asking if he had sent the invitation. Robert instantly understood, tricking her into thinking it was spam with potential viruses and not to click it. The naive Cole believed him. The cloned Cole's hope for her real self's arrival was dashed, replaced by an angry Robert. He entered, spouted some high-sounding principles, and prepared to rage. Cole accepted all the blame, saying she had to be made an example of to prevent rebellion. But as Robert raised his hand, a brave woman stepped forward to plead for her. Robert relented, forgiving Cole, but decided the brave woman would take her punishment instead. With a wave of his hand, he turned her into a beast identical to the previous one, rendering her speechless. Afterward, he ordered her to be thrown onto a desolate planet and logged out of the game. Feelings of guilt and remorse flooded Cole. At that moment, she noticed a wormhole in the distance, with data being transmitted. She realized that the Christmas update patch was pre-installing, meaning the game was still connected to the internet in some way. If they could fly the ship into the wormhole, they could attack the system's firewall, allowing everyone to be deleted and finally die. It was better than enduring the abuse of the ruthless captain. But the ship could only move when Robert was present, unless they moved it while he was pausing the game. The wormhole was too far away, and it would take a long time to reach. They needed someone in the outside world to stall Robert. The cloned Cole decided to find a way to get his tablet, and use private photos from her cloud album to blackmail her real self, forcing her to help the people in the game. The plan was great, and everyone agreed to join, except for Walton. 
In the beginning, it was just him and Robert in the game. The arrogant Walton refused to submit, so one day, the real-life Walton brought his son to work. The cunning Robert secretly extracted DNA from the lollipop boy had eaten, copying him into the game. To force Walton to comply, Robert threw the cloned boy into space, making Walton watch as his son compressed, froze, and shattered in the void. The most terrifying part was that Robert still had Walton's son's DNA stored in a mini-fridge in his room, along with the DNA of everyone else. He could copy them into the game countless times, so death was useless. However, Cole told him that she would obtain and destroy everyone's DNA, but he had to trust her. Sure enough, one day after work, Robert found the lollipop next to the milk in his fridge. He logged back into the game and Cole had changed, becoming submissive and taking the initiative to report to the captain about a distress signal from a crashed spaceship on a certain planet. Robert ordered the rescue and Cole suggested they go together, both to strengthen their bond and to improve her skills. Robert, a homebody, couldn't resist the beautiful woman and agreed. They arrived at the planet and found the abandoned spaceship. Cole then began to undress and seduce Robert in a nearby river. Unable to withstand her continuous teasing, Robert undressed and left his tablet on the shore. As soon as he left, the other crew members teleported the tablet back to the cockpit. Using the password Cole had given them, they accessed her cloud photo album, found some compromising photos, and sent them to the real-life Cole, threatening to expose her unless she followed their instructions. She had no choice but to comply. Meanwhile, Robert was playing in the water with the cloned Cole, enjoying the romantic atmosphere. After giving orders to the real-life Cole, the crew members quickly sent the tablet back. She ordered a pizza for Robert, and when the delivery arrived, the tablet rang, interrupting his fun. Although annoyed, Robert paused the game to receive the delivery. The real-life Cole took the opportunity to sneak into the house and retrieve everyone's DNA from the fridge. Things went smoothly, and they could now head towards the wormhole, though they were short on time as the wormhole was about to close. After eating the pizza, Robert returned to the game and found the bikini-clad beauty gone. Furious, he realized it was an act of rebellion. He quickly got dressed, found the abandoned spaceship, and chased after the Callister the ship Cole was on. She was passing through an asteroid belt, and the ship was badly damaged. Robert was furious, threatening the crew members with punishments a thousand times worse than before. The Callister crashed into an asteroid, and its main engine stopped working. To fix it, someone would have to crawl into the thrust regulator and manually operate it, but at the risk of severe burns and death. The courageous Walton volunteered to repair it for his son's happiness, sacrificing his own body to fix the ship. With the engine restored, they sped towards the wormhole, and the friends held hands, entering it just before it closed. However, they didn't die but were reborn. The firewall had only cleared Robert's game module. They were now in the cloud, free from his control. Robert was trapped in his game forever, and the real-life Walton fell into a vegetative state, unable to regain consciousness. They had truly trapped themselves. All the crew members of the Callister entered the internet and became players in the game. Cole was appointed as the new captain, and they were free to roam the game-generated universe, going wherever they pleased, except for Robert, who was treated as malicious code and deleted, trapped forever in the game. The second story, titled Archangel, takes place in a hospital delivery room. It's Marie's first child. Due to various reasons, natural delivery isn't possible, and a cesarean section is required. As a result, she's filled with guilt towards her baby and keeps apologizing to the unborn child. The baby is finally born, and the doctors whisper to each other, saying something under their breath. Marie anxiously asks them about the situation. When she learns that the baby is perfectly healthy, she can finally breathe a sigh of relief. The doctor brings the baby to the mother's side. The baby, Sarah, grows up, and in the blink of an eye, she's already three years old. She has a great relationship with her grandfather. One day, Marie takes her to the park. As they pass by a neighbor's house, a vicious dog barks nonstop from the yard. Marie can't help but quicken her pace. They arrive at a small park by the roadside, and Sarah happily plays on the slide by herself. Marie runs into a friend, and they chat about their daily lives. Meanwhile, Sarah spots a cat, and after petting it, the cat runs away. Sarah chases after it. Marie realizes she hasn't seen her daughter for a while and looks for her, only to find her missing. The entire family is frantic with worry, and they mobilize everyone to search for her. Fortunately, a kind-hearted person finds Sarah and returns her to her mother. Marie hugs her daughter and keeps apologizing to Sarah. 
Coincidentally, Marie hears about a high-tech experimental project called Archangel and brings her daughter to the lab. The staff assures her that the product is completely safe, and Marie, now at ease, agrees to proceed. Before the procedure, the staff distracts Sarah with a cartoon. Then, they take out a long syringe and insert it into her temple before removing it. In just a few seconds, the device is effortlessly implanted into Sarah's brain. Next, the staff brings out a parental monitoring device and teaches Marie how to use it. By simply tapping an icon, Sarah's location can be displayed. Additionally, the device can monitor Sarah's vital signs, including her heart rate and other health conditions. The most advanced feature allows the user to view everything from Sarah's perspective in first person. The last feature can limit the content that the child sees. If Sarah encounters something stimulating, causing her cortisol levels to rise, the device can engage a filtering function and blur the image. Of course, this feature can be manually controlled, turned on or off as needed. With Archangel, Marie can now keep an eye on her daughter's every move, giving her peace of mind. She even plays hide-and-seek with Sarah by monitoring her actions on the screen. When they go out again, Marie blurs the image of the vicious dog next door, ensuring her daughter won't be frightened anymore. One day, Marie leaves for work and leaves her daughter in the care of her father at home. She works as a physiotherapist, busy treating her patients. At home, her father suddenly suffers a heart attack and collapses. He pleads with Sarah to call her mother. However, Sarah sees only a blurred mosaic and cannot hear anything due to the Archangel filter. Fortunately, the monitoring device sounds an alarm. Marie checks the screen, turns off the mosaic filter, and realizes what has happened. Her father is saved in time but has trouble walking from then on. Under the watchful eye of the monitoring device, Sarah happily plays in the yard by herself. Time flies, and the little girl grows up. Her grandfather passes away, but the Archangel device continues to operate. Now Marie's sad expression is even blurred by the filter. One day, Sarah arrives at school where her classmate, Trick, shows a violent video to a group of girls. Sarah, curious but unable to see it, desperately wants to know what happens. Trick tries to describe the events to her, but the filter mutes his violent expressions, actions, and voice. At home, Sarah tries to draw the scene, but her pen's depiction of blood also turns into a mosaic. The more she cannot see, the more she wants to know. Frustrated, she sharpens a pencil and stabs her own finger to see the blood, but it's still a mosaic. The tablet's alarm sounds, alerting Marie to Sarah's semi-hysterical state, and Sarah receives a smack from her mother, who thinks she's acting out. Marie returns to the Archangel Center, and the staff discovers that Sarah can't discern people's expressions or intense actions, all thanks to the mosaic filter. The staff says the device has been banned in Europe and will be removed from the market soon. They explain that although Sarah's implanted device cannot be removed, destroying the monitoring screen would solve the problem. Marie realizes her mistake, goes home, deactivates the filtering feature, and turns off the device before storing it in a cabinet. Without the screen's protection, Sarah attends school for the first time with unfiltered eyes. Marie, restless at home, can finally hear the neighbor's menacing dog barking, and the streets seem fraught with danger. Unable to resist, she turns on the tablet again and feels relieved upon seeing that Sarah's location is at school. Sarah entered the school grounds and happened to see Trick getting into a fight. Upon seeing his injured lip, she learned for the first time what color blood was. Trick then became Sarah's enlightening teacher, showing her romance films, violent movies, and gory flicks. From that point on, Marie completely hid the monitoring device. With the neighbor's dog as her companion, Sarah grew up and became a high school student. The once menacing dog turned into her good friend, all for the price of a small sausage. One day after school, Sarah bumped into Trick. He invited her to hang out by the lake in the evening. Sarah had always harbored special feelings for him, so she made up an excuse, telling her mother she was going to a female classmate's house to watch a Daniel C.C. movie. Coincidentally, Marie had plans that evening and agreed. A group of young boys and girls sat around a bonfire, chatting happily. Sarah learned to smoke and nestled in Trick's arms. Marie had just finished an intimate encounter with one of her former patients when she called her daughter but received no answer. She was slightly worried and called her daughter's friend's mother for confirmation. That's when she learned that Sarah had never gone to her friend's house to watch a movie. She began calling Sarah's classmates homes, but none of the parents knew where she was. Worried, she unearthed the long-forgotten Archangel device and saw that it was located by a small lake. Turning on the live monitoring, she saw a young boy pinning her daughter down, and she couldn't bear to watch. Sarah and Trick exchanged sweet nothings, and after that, they both headed home. 
Marie closely followed her daughter's movements, and Trick drove Sarah to her doorstep. When her daughter arrived home, Marie pretended not to know anything and didn't confront her. The next day, Sarah claimed she was helping a female friend with a project and would be home late. In reality, she was meeting up with Trick after school. The young couple chatted for a while before Sarah discovered that Trick was earning money by delivering illegal substances for others. Under the influence of Trick, Sarah fell into the illegal acts. Marie knew Sarah was lying, so she kept the tablet on. The Archangel device sounded an alarm. She checked the screen only to find their axe. She was furious and close to losing it. She pulled up previous records to find Trick's face, circled it, and ran a search on her computer. She successfully found his full name and the company he worked for. The angry Marie went straight to Trick's workplace and threatened him, saying her daughter was only 15 and he was teaching her such things. She demanded that he either stay away from her daughter or she would show the evidence to the police. She vowed to monitor her daughter's actions through the Archangel device and stormed off after giving him a piece of her mind. After returning home, Sarah, as usual, tried to call Trick, but all her calls were rejected and her messages went unanswered. Heartbroken, Sarah spent her days unable to focus on anything, persistently sending texts to her lover. All of this was observed by her mother. Unable to bear it any longer, Sarah went to Trick's workplace to ask him the reason for his silence. Trick, knowing Sarah was being watched by her mother, didn't dare tell the truth and simply said he couldn't be with her. Sure enough, Marie was monitoring everything from behind a screen. Feeling like she had fallen into a deep abyss, Sarah walked away, desperate. Meanwhile, Marie secretly went to the pharmacy, bought emergency contraception, crushed it, and mixed it into Sarah's juice. The next day, during class, the effects of the drug kicked in. Sarah felt nauseous, ran to the bathroom, and then went to the nurse's office for a checkup. The nurse informed her that the contraceptive pill had terminated her pregnancy. Sarah had an inkling of what happened and rushed home, searching everywhere until she found the discarded box of contraceptive pills in the trash. She then went to her mother's room and found the surveillance device. Reviewing the playback, she discovered that her mother had been meddling behind the scenes. Unable to stay in the house any longer, Sarah decided to leave. Just then, Marie returned home and, seeing the disarray, knew that her secret had been revealed. As mother and daughter faced each other on the stairs, Sarah snatched the tablet from her mother, trying to turn it off but not knowing how. Marie cried, saying she only wanted to protect her. But Sarah, enraged once more, repeatedly struck her mother's head with the tablet. The mosaic effect on the screen made her feel like she wasn't doing anything wrong. It wasn't until the tablet was broken and the mosaic function automatically turned off that Sarah realized she had brutally beaten her mother, leaving her disfigured. In a panic, she grabbed her luggage and ran out of the house. Fortunately, the broken tablet wasn't enough to cause a fatality. Marie, face covered in blood, picked up the shattered device and stepped outside, tearfully calling out her daughter's name. The damaged tablet could no longer function, making it impossible to track Sarah's whereabouts. Sarah, determined never to return home, walked alone to a highway, flagged down a tanker truck, and pondered what awaited her next. The third story, titled Crocodile, begins with Rob and Mia being a loving couple. One day they went to a club to have a good time. As the day turned into evening, they found themselves driving on a snow-covered road. Rob, humming a tune and stealing glances at the beauty beside him, lost control of the car. As the screeching brakes pierced the air, they hit a person. The couple got out of the car to check the situation. They found a mangled bicycle and the lifeless body of the cyclist. Mia wanted to call the police, but Rob stopped her. He was drunk while driving. This would be a serious crime. Mia reluctantly agreed to help him stuff the body into a sleeping bag. Together, they dragged it to a nearby lake, weighed it down with heavy stones, and dumped it in, along with the bicycle. On their way back, the atmosphere was tense, and they didn't exchange a word. Fifteen years passed, and Mia had transformed into a renowned architect, preparing to give an invited lecture. After a successful presentation, Mia paid for a pizza through her phone and picked it up from a vending machine, then returned to her hotel room. Across the street was a dental clinic. Someone knocked on the door. It was Rob, who'd come to discuss an urgent matter. They hadn't seen each other for many years since their divorce. The smell of malt from a nearby brewery wafted through the air. Rob had come to talk about the accident from 15 years ago, which he couldn't forget. He showed her a news clipping. The dead cyclist's wife had never remarried, still waiting for her husband to return. The guilt-ridden Rob wanted to send an anonymous letter to the wife, intending to tell her her husband was dead. But Mia disagreed, fearing the police could trace it back to them. 
Mia, now a successful professional with a nine-year-old son, couldn't allow her past to ruin her life. But Rob was determined to send the letter. As he turned to leave, she used all her strength to stop him, accidentally pushing him to the ground. His head hit the hard concrete and blood seeped out. In a desperate move, Mia strangled him until he stopped struggling, suffocating him to death. Nervously, she peeked out the window and saw a vending machine hit a pedestrian. The dentist across the street witnessed the scene as well. She quickly closed the curtains to avoid being seen. An insurance worker named Shazia used a modern device to collect people's memories of car accidents to determine fault and settle claims. Today was her birthday, and her husband gifted her a hamster as a present. Although Shazia wasn't particularly fond of it, she thought the cute little creature could become a good friend for their family's beloved pet. Mia ordered room service, and the waiter brought it over. By this time, she had hidden Rob's body under the bed. After the waiter left, she played an adult film on the TV and let it run. Then she hid the body under the serving cart, sneaked down the emergency exit to the garage, and put the body in the back seat of her car. She drove to a remote construction site where the buildings were designed by her. Familiar with the terrain, she waited for the workers to leave before dragging the body to a well and tossing it in. Then she went back to her hotel room, pretending to watch the adult film all night. As expected, the hotel staff remembered her the next day when she paid an additional fee for the film. As she drove away, she passed by Shazia, who was investigating the pizza truck accident from the day before. Unfortunately, the surveillance footage had been destroyed. Shazia went to the victim's home to discuss compensation. The injured man was a musician who was supposed to go on tour, but his arm had been injured by the pizza truck, and he couldn't go. If they could prove the pizza truck company was responsible, he could receive a large sum of money. Shazia carried a memory extraction device that could retrieve people's memories and project them onto a screen. She inserted a square device into the man's temple and had him smell a beer from a nearby brewery to trigger memories of the day. The man closed his eyes as Shazia turned on the device and his memories appeared on the screen. He recalled passing a beautiful woman with luscious red lips before being hit by the truck and losing consciousness. Although there were no solid leads, they now had a new eyewitness, the red-lipped woman. On the other side, Mia arrived home, trying her best to hide her emotions from her family. Her son had a choir performance that night and was dressed in a small suit. Her husband had to go early to help with the sound equipment, so they agreed to meet at the theater at 7.30 p.m. After they left, Mia drank alone at home, hoping to drown her sorrows. Meanwhile, Shazia entered the red-lipped woman's photo into a system, quickly identifying her through facial recognition and obtaining her information and address. She drove to the woman's workplace and used the memory extraction device on her, hoping to determine if the pizza truck was speeding. However, the red-lipped woman could only recall the aftermath of the accident and couldn't confirm the truck's speed. But she remembered seeing a flash of light on the glass coming from a dental clinic. After that, Shazia went back to the scene and found the dental clinic, meeting the dentist and using the memory extraction device on him. The dentist had an unusual sexual orientation, and that day after treating a patient, he saw a handsome man who had just showered through the window. He tried to take a photo but forgot to turn off the flash, so he only captured the reflection on the glass. He then accidentally looked up and saw Mia following her gaze to the accident scene. However, he didn't see the accident unfold. Learning of the new information, Shazia went to the hotel to investigate Mia, but the waiter, concerned about privacy, refused to disclose any information about Mia, only mentioning that she enjoyed watching adult films that night. Shazia had no choice but to return home and use her computer's facial recognition technology to identify the woman from a blurry photo, eventually finding her address. Although it was far away, Shazia decided to work overtime and visit her for a chance at double the bonus. She told her husband about her plan and bid him farewell. After some time, she finally arrived at Mia's house. After explaining her intentions, Mia briefly described the accident she witnessed. However, Shazia insisted on entering the house for a more detailed investigation. Naturally, Mia was reluctant, but Shazia said it was a legal requirement for witnesses to cooperate or else she would have to call the police. Reluctantly, Mia let her in. When she found out that Shazia would use a memory extraction device, Mia panicked. She insisted that she could describe everything clearly without it, but Shazia said she needed to confirm the vehicle's speed. Mia had no choice but to comply. Shazia reassured her that she only cared about the accident and showed her the relevant legal provisions. She promised not to pry into Mia's private affairs at the hotel. Mia made coffee for Shazia and considered using the fruit knife on the table to kill her. She then went to the bathroom to try to hypnotize herself and remove any memories related to the murder. 
After attaching the receiving device to her temple, the memory extraction machine started working. The screen displayed adult film images, followed by images of the accident, but it also showed her murdering Rob and a 15-year-old accident where she had killed someone and disposed of the body. Realizing the danger, Shazia pretended to have completed the memory collection and tried to leave quickly. However, the more anxious she became, the harder it was to start the car. Mia then used a large stone to break the car window, dragged Shazia to a nearby storage room and tied her up. Hesitant, Mia was afraid Shazia would expose her. Shazia begged for her shitty life, promising to keep the secret. The problem was the memory device had recorded everything and could not be deleted. Mia asked Shazia if anyone knew about her visit today, and Shazia quickly lied that no one knew. To confirm her truthfulness, Mia used the memory extraction machine on Shazia, and an image of Shazia's husband appeared on the screen. It seemed killing Shazia alone wouldn't be enough. Mia became increasingly entangled in her crimes, murdering another innocent person. She set Shazia's car's navigation to her home. After arriving, she snuck in with a pre-prepared hammer and struck Shazia's husband while he was taking a bath. The man, with blood pouring from his head, sank into the bathtub, either dead or doomed to drown. As she left the room, she saw Shazia's baby. Although the baby couldn't speak, the memory extraction machine was still a threat. Tragically, the innocent child couldn't escape his fate. Having wiped out the entire family, Mia arrived calmly at the theater at 7.30 p.m. Other parents happily watched their children's performances, and the atmosphere was full of joy. Her son, along with his friends, put on a fantastic show, but Mia's mood plummeted, and she shed some crocodile tears. The police arrived at the crime scene, baffled by who could commit such heinous acts, even killing a newborn baby. Mia never knew that the baby was actually born blind. However, the officer then noticed the hamster on the table. The investigation team got to work to extract memories from the hamster. With the memory images, the police located Mia and prepared to arrest Mia outside her home. Mia saw the police behind her, and she knew she would face the judgment of the law. The fourth story, titled Hand the DJ, begins with the man Frank walking down a dark path at night. Guided by the device in his hand, he entered a venue and with the help of the faint light from the sky, made his way to the second floor restaurant. Not long after he sat down, a young woman approached him. Her device displayed Frank's face, indicating that he was the person arranged for her. So the two met for the first time. The young woman introduced herself as Amy. Frank was visibly nervous, babbling as he held up his device, explaining it was his first time using this system for a date. Amy admitted that it was her first time, too. The two hit it off, joking and laughing. They even fed each other playfully after chatting for a while. At this point, they decided to check their date's predetermined time limit, which was 12 hours. Both were quite fond of each other and felt the time was too short. The device then started a countdown, urging them not to waste any time. They quickly finished their meal and left. Soon, an autonomous vehicle arranged by the system arrived to pick them up. They leaned against each other, admiring the beautiful scenery and enjoying the peaceful moonlit night. The self-driving car took them to room 473. The door opened automatically by recognizing their fingerprints. The room was quite nice, well-equipped, and decorated with a modern touch. It was a one-bedroom apartment with a double bed, so they had to share it. Amy excused herself to use the restroom, quickly grabbing the device to ask the system if she should sleep with Frank that night. At the same time, Frank was asking the same question of his device. The system told them to decide for themselves without seeking its advice. Frank, being a gentleman, offered to sleep on the couch. Amy, not wanting to take advantage of the situation, suggested they sleep in the bed, as it would remain empty otherwise. Frank gladly accepted the offer and they lay down together. Unable to sleep in the middle of the night, they chatted about how people had to pursue love on their own before without this system. Faced with so many choices, it was easy to become overwhelmed, and the thought of breaking up felt disastrous. Nowadays, things were much simpler, with the system helping to make those decisions. Their hands slowly moved towards each other, clasping together. They treated each other with respect, and nothing happened that night. The following day, early in the morning, it was time for Frank and Amy to part ways. As they left the room, they were reluctant to say goodbye. Frank confessed that he really liked Amy, and she playfully responded that if they ever got another chance, they would definitely get it on. They let go of each other's hands and took separate cars arranged by the system. After parting, Amy had a somewhat melancholic conversation with the system, questioning the purpose of having such a short 12-hour date. The system explained that despite the brevity, her reactions would provide valuable information. 
Meanwhile, Frank believed Amy was his perfect match, but the system told him that his final partner had not yet been determined. The system would collect information, analyze data, and eventually select the best match with a 99.8% success rate, but only after numerous relationships. At that moment, both Frank and Amy received messages from the system that new relationships were about to begin. This time, Amy matched with a charming, handsome man, which made her happy. Meanwhile, Frank found himself with a woman he didn't particularly like, and she didn't appreciate his humor. The system required them to live together for a year. Amy's relationship with the charming man, Lenny, was set to last for nine months. She was quite happy with this arrangement. Lenny had plenty of dating experience, having been matched by the system five times before. After taking a shower together, Lenny suggested they should just get it on right away to build intimacy and understand their compatibility. Amy agreed because she was impressed by his humor and charm, and they pressed the confirmation button. Their intimate time went well, but Amy felt embarrassed by the noises Lenny made after drinking water. On Frank's end, he had just experienced an unsatisfactory hormone yoga session with the woman he didn't like. She complained about the taste of curry in his mouth during their intimate time and criticized his limited repertoire of positions. The thought of living with her for a year was unbearable. Frank asked the system if they could break up, but the system refused, assuring him that one day it would provide him with his final partner. That same day, Frank and the unlikable woman attended a friend's engagement party together. The couple on stage praised the system, attributing their perfect match to it. They urged everyone to trust the system, claiming it was truly effective. During dinner, Frank deliberately annoyed the woman by eating food with garlic sauce. She complained again, and he continued eating, making her leave in frustration. That's when he ran into Amy again. Frank choked on his food, ultimately vomiting on Amy's shoes. Despite his embarrassment, Amy didn't mind, and they laughed together like old friends. Lenny arrived, and after introductions, the party ended. Frank politely said goodbye to Amy and Lenny and left. On their way back, Amy kept looking back, while Frank followed behind with a somber expression. Lenny was indeed handsome, but looks couldn't provide sustenance. In bed, they didn't communicate, nor did they hold hands. Amy found it most unbearable when Lenny made a noise after drinking water. She finally confronted him about it, and he promised to try and change. But right after his promise, he started cleaning his ears in bed. Time flew when Amy was with someone she liked, but when with someone she disliked, it dragged on. After nine months, the feelings she had for Lenny when they first met had faded. He wasn't the right person for her. As soon as their time was up, Amy couldn't wait to leave. Afterward, the system matched Amy with many new partners, but her time with each person was always short-lived. In the days that followed, she constantly changed partners, saying goodbye after each encounter. None of them could make her heart race. On the other hand, Frank endured a year of agony, and his torturous cohabitation with the unpleasant woman finally came to an end. As soon as the time was up, she left without looking back. Just as Frank started doubting the system's effectiveness, a new match arrived. Surprisingly, it was Amy. They hugged tightly, both thrilled about their reunion. Amy vented her frustrations, talking about her dull life during that time and how she couldn't even remember the names of her past partners. Frank also shared his uninteresting life with the woman he despised over the past year. They both cherished their time together and ultimately agreed not to look at the final deadline on their devices, allowing themselves to enjoy each other's company without constraint. When nighttime rolled around, Frank was no longer the composed gentleman he had been before. They joked happily, kissing and hugging each other. The indescribable feeling of bliss enveloped them as their hands intertwined once again. The next morning, they chatted on a picturesque forest path. Amy worried that the system might not be as intelligent as it claimed, and they might not end up together in the end. Frank shared the same concern. During their happy times, the most pressing thing on Frank's mind was how much longer they had together. He wanted to sneak a peek, but restrained himself. After they took a bath together, the urge returned, but he suppressed it again. Late at night, unable to sleep, he finally couldn't hold back any longer and asked the system how much time was left for them. The screen showed that they had five years to live together, which excited Frank. Suddenly, the screen displayed that it was recalibrating and the time was reduced to three years. It turned out that Frank's unilateral checking of the date caused the change. The time continued to decrease, 18 months, two months, three weeks, five days, finally stopping at 20 hours. Then the countdown began. Frank was full of regret and blamed himself. He feigned happiness when Amy flirted with him, not daring to tell her the truth. 
As they strolled through a mall together, Frank's mood was noticeably down. Sensing something was wrong, Amy finally asked what was bothering him. Frank told her the truth, and she blamed him for breaking their promise. Learning that the time was shortened because Frank had checked, she became even angrier. Frank tried to convince her that they could ignore the deadline, jump over the wall, and leave the place together. Amy disagreed and, still upset, left him first. It seemed like everyone around them was watching, perhaps monitoring their actions. Frank returned to their room alone, guarding an empty bed. The system told him that they would evaluate his reaction to the premature ending of a precious relationship and improve the profile of his true love. Distraught, Frank expressed his desire to escape over the wall, but the system warned that he would be expelled for violating the rules. After venting his anger and frustrations, Frank had no choice but to leave the place full of memories when the time came. Afterward, the two of them went back to living their lifeless lives, just like before. Amy could never find the right person for her. She watched as the men by her side constantly changed, none leaving a lasting impression on her. They were just fleeting passers-by. Frank, on the other hand, only ever had Amy in his heart. Even when he was intimate with others, he thought of Amy and shared their story with other women. One day, the system told Amy that her final match had been confirmed and their pairing day was set for tomorrow. After that, they would leave this place forever. During this time, she could choose to say goodbye to anyone she wanted. Without hesitation, she chose Frank as the one to bid farewell. The long-lost lovers finally met again at their old spot. Ignoring the stares of others, they embraced and tongue-massaged each other passionately. However, their time together was painfully short, just over a minute. Frank revealed that his final pairing day was also tomorrow. They both agreed that they didn't want the partners chosen for them by the system. They only wanted to be with each other. They couldn't remember where they lived before, but they felt a sense of familiarity with each other. The system had continuously separated them, only to bring them back together again. Amy believed that this must be a test, and they had to resist together to pass it and leave this place. No matter what was beyond the wall, they would face it together. As they decided to leave, it seemed like everyone around them was watching. The couple held hands and charged forward, ignoring the onlookers. At that moment, a security guard approached them, raising a crackling stun gun. Amy, fearless, walked up and pressed her hand against it. However, she wasn't electrocuted, and the guard's hand was pushed down instead. Suddenly, the world seemed to freeze. Everyone stood still and motionless. The two of them walked hand in hand through the unmoving crowd, eventually reaching the edge of the world. To ensure Amy's safety, Frank climbed beneath her as they tried to scale the towering wall together. Halfway up, the lights on the ground went out and the world changed. A dark mass swallowed them both. They found themselves in a strange place, with the number 998 above their heads. There were countless pairs of identical people around them, each with different numbers. What did these numbers represent? Suddenly, the people transformed into blue orbs, which then merged together. The data showed that 1,000 simulations had been completed with 998 instances of resistance. The match rate was 99.8%. The system turned out to be an app on their phone, simulating love. Their previous selves were DNA clones extracted from their real bodies, completing the love test on their behalf. Now, their real selves met for the first time in the real world. Finally discovering each other, they were ready to get acquainted. The fifth story, titled Black Museum, begins with Nish driving on a winding mountain road. She hums along to music and enjoys the picturesque scenery along the route. She stops at a charging station to refuel her car, but it appears to be closed with no staff in sight. Left with no choice, Nish rummages through the trunk and retrieves a large, solar-powered charger. The screen indicates that it'll take over three hours to fully charge the car. Nearby, she spots a mysterious black museum and decides to explore it to pass the time. The curator, Mr. Rolo, warmly greets her and warns her that the exhibits can be quite terrifying. Undaunted, Nish enters the museum. Mr. Rolo inspects her bag and guides her through a security checkpoint before allowing her inside. Many of the exhibits in the museum have appeared in previous episodes of Black Mirror. Mr. Rolo strikes up a conversation with Nish and guides her to the main exhibition hall. The room is uncomfortably warm, and Mr. Rolo struggles to fix the malfunctioning smart air conditioner. Among the exhibits, they come across a tablet featuring the killer bees and Archangel. Mr. Rolo shares his background in neuroscience and explains that he used to specialize in medical technology and worked in a hospital for some time. Nish is drawn to an exhibit resembling hairdressing equipment. 
As Mr. Rollo introduces the exhibit, he recounts a story from his time at the hospital. There was a doctor named Dawson, under whose care the patient mortality rates remained alarmingly high. One day, another patient died due to surgical complications and the patient stopped breathing. Mr. Rollo brought Dr. Dawson to his office and presented two lab rat specimens. He explained that his research group had once conducted an experiment with the rats. Rat A was placed in a maze and played in it for several months, learning the maze's layout. The team then attached a transmitter to Rat A and a receiver to Rat B, hoping that Rat B would be able to navigate the maze using the information from Rat A's brain. Unfortunately, the experiment failed, and Rat B dashed around aimlessly like a headless fly. However, a surprising discovery was made when a researcher accidentally spilled hot coffee on Rat A. Rat B let out a scream, proving that although the rats couldn't share brain information, they could share physical sensations. Interestingly, Rat B experienced the pain of the burn, but was left completely unharmed. And so, a cutting-edge product known as a neural implant was born. Mr. Rollo understood Dr. Dawson's predicament. As a doctor, the most challenging aspect was not being able to accurately assess a patient's condition and pain. For comatose patients, infants who couldn't speak, and non-English speakers, this detecting technology could greatly improve surgical success rates. Mr. Rollo performed a minor surgery on Dr. Dawson, implanting a sensor in his brain, making him look like a cyborg. The test began. The device emitting blue light could be worn on the head to absorb people's physiological sensations and transmit them to Dawson's neural implant. Mr. Rollo tried pricking a volunteer's finger with a pencil, and sure enough, Dr. Dawson felt the pain in his own ring finger. They quickly applied the device to patients, initially for minor injuries in the emergency room and later for more severe conditions and terminal illnesses. For example, when a child was admitted to the hospital with suspected appendicitis, they would bring him to Dr. Dawson for confirmation. Having already experienced appendicitis multiple times, he would immediately know if there were other symptoms. He helped many patients with this method. However, the sensor also played a significant role in intimate situations. The implant could receive pleasure, meaning that if a girlfriend wore the device during intimacy, both partners could experience the dual pleasure of a man and a woman. But one day, a severely pained senator was brought into the hospital. Unable to speak, he relied on Dr. Dawson for diagnosis. Dr. Dawson went through the most painful experience of his life, a pain he had never felt before. The senator eventually died, and it was later confirmed that he had been poisoned. Dr. Dawson experienced death for the first time. He passed out for five minutes before coming back to life, but in the moment he experienced death, many of his brain neurons died, releasing a large amount of endorphins. Dr. Dawson developed a severe sense of emptiness. Afterward, he underwent a full-body examination and was found to be in perfect health, but the implant was damaged and Dr. Dawson became obsessed with the sensation of pain. It became like an addiction. The stronger the pain, the greater the pleasure he felt. During intimate moments with his girlfriend, he began to experiment with hair pulling and choking. Ultimately, his girlfriend couldn't bear his deviant behavior and angrily left him. Afterward, Dr. Dawson began spending all his time in the emergency room, even staying after his shift, waiting for critically ill patients to arrive, in hopes of experiencing the pleasure produced by pain. One day, a comatose patient was brought in, and Dr. Dawson realized the patient had a heart condition. However, to fully enjoy the pleasure, he pretended not to know anything and delayed treatment. As a result, the patient missed the optimal treatment window and died in front of everyone. Mr. Rollo decided that Dr. Dawson could no longer be allowed near patients and gave him a long leave to rest at home. Alone in his empty home, Dr. Dawson became listless, like an addict deprived of drugs. With no patients to share their pain, he resorted to harm himself, using broken glass to pierce his fingertips. Over the course of a week, he cut and stabbed himself daily. He quickly became unrecognizable, but it wasn't enough due to lack of fear. He could usually experience the pleasure that fear brought from his patients, but self-harm couldn't provide it. Dr. Dawson could only seek this sensation from others. One night, he attacked a homeless man, placing the device on his head and driving a power drill into his forehead, watching him suffer before donating the homeless man a free home in hell. When the police arrested him, Dr. Dawson was still in a state of euphoria, enjoying the combined pleasure of fear, pain, and death. From then on, Dr. Dawson was confined to a hospital as a vegetative patient. After telling this story, Mr. Rollo was incredibly thirsty. He took the water bottle offered by Nish and nearly drank the entire bottle. Mr. Rollo then led her to a stuffed monkey toy, which was also one of his previous research projects. 
He then shared another story. A man named Jack met a woman named Carrie, and they quickly fell in love, got married, and had children. One day, Carrie wanted to take a picture with her husband and son. However, while taking the photo, she was struck by a car and sent to the hospital in a coma, becoming a vegetative patient from that moment on. Every week, Jack deeply loved his wife and would visit her, talk to her, and play videos of their son, but to no avail. So the doctors installed a coma communication device for Carrie, which allowed her to respond while in a coma. The device had two lights, and Jack would ask yes or no questions. Carrie would then respond using different colored lights. Mr. Rollo learned of their situation and told Jack about a new project he was developing that could, in some way, bring Carrie back to life. It involved extracting Carrie's consciousness in digital form from her damaged brain and implanting it into Jack's brain, allowing them to share one brain and experience everything together. If Jack hugged their son, Carrie would feel it too. Jack hesitated, but Carrie expressed her willingness through the coma communication device. The surgery began. The medical staff used a syringe-like device to extract Carrie's consciousness from her brain and transfer it into Jack's. With a snap of his fingers, Mr. Rolo awakened Carrie, who now felt as if she was sitting in a movie theater, observing everything through Jack's brain. She could communicate with him, and they could both sense everything the other experienced. However, it didn't take long for problems to arise. The couple couldn't agree on everything. Carrie complained that Jack read too slowly while he preferred to take his time. They also disagreed on how to raise their child. Jack felt like he was under constant surveillance, with no privacy or autonomy. To others, he seemed like a schizophrenic, acting strangely. He sought help from Mr. Rolo, who upgraded the control system, allowing him to pause sharing his senses with Carrie through a smartphone. One day, Jack encountered an attractive woman in the elevator, and his gaze was drawn to her chest. Carrie, still in his mind, became jealous and started to argue with him. Eventually, Jack decided to pause the sensory sharing. When he resumed it, two months had passed for Carrie. Outraged, she demanded to see and embrace their son. To compromise, the couple agreed that Jack would pause sensory sharing with Carrie on weekdays, resuming it on weekends to spend time with their son together. But their happiness was short-lived. One day, a beautiful woman moved in next door to Jack, causing his hormones to surge and provoking a physical reaction. Carrie's anger burned as she protested non-stop in Jack's mind. He finally stopped the sensory sharing. In the days that followed, Jack found a new hormone partner. They became a couple and spent weekends together, much to Carrie's annoyance, who complained constantly from within Jack's mind. Feeling helpless, Jack went to Mr. Rolo for help, bringing along his new love interest. Mr. Rolo suggested erasing Carrie's consciousness. Jack's new partner was more than eager, but Jack couldn't bear the thought and refused to do so. Observing the situation, Mr. Rolo took them to his lab and brought out a toy monkey. He advised transferring Carrie's consciousness into this toy. It can observe its surroundings through a camera, and Carrie would be able to feel it when her son hugs it. The couple agreed. Unbeknownst to Carrie, they transferred her consciousness into the monkey. When she opened her eyes again, she had become her son's new toy. No one could hear her words. Her protests were in vain. To communicate with the outside world, she could only press two buttons on either side of her. Pressing the left button with a smiling face would make the toy say, Monkey loves you, while pressing the right button with a crying face would make it say, Monkey wants a hug. Carrie went crazy, pressing the buttons wildly to express her dissatisfaction. But she had become a toy, and there was nothing she could do about it. Jack's new partner grabbed the toy, threatening Carrie either to have her consciousness erased or be a good toy. With no choice left, Carrie had to accept her fate and compromise. However, it wasn't long before their son grew tired of his new toy. Carrie was cast aside, unable to even fulfill her small wish for a hug. Mr. Rolo said that the monkey represented the root of evil because the United Nations had declared transferring human consciousness into the monkeys would be illegal a few years prior. To be legal, the object must be able to express at least five emotions to be considered humane. Deleting consciousness was also illegal. As a result, Carrie's consciousness was still trapped in the monkey. After this incident, Mr. Rolo was fired from the research institution and he built this museum. Nish returned the monkey to its original place and Mr. Rolo pulled back a red curtain, preparing to unveil the grand finale for her. Inside the glass display, there was a holographic projection of a disheveled man. Mr. Rolo explained that his name was Clayton and not to feel pity for him. 
Clayton had murdered a weather forecaster and was a convicted killer. After being fired, Mr. Rolo planned to develop the field of celebrity consciousness and turn the consciousness of the deceased into holographic projections. However, celebrities had too many complications, so he turned to murderers instead. He found Clayton, who was about to be executed. Clayton claimed he was falsely accused and hoped Mr. Rolo could use DNA technology to clear his name. But that wasn't Mr. Rolo's goal. He wanted Clayton to grant him the rights to his digital consciousness. In exchange, Clayton's family would receive a significant sum of money, ensuring their financial stability for life. Clayton persuaded his tearful wife to sign the authorization with Mr. Rolo. He was then sentenced to death and taken to the electric chair. As Clayton was executed, Mr. Rolo placed a consciousness collector on his head, capturing Clayton's digital consciousness, which was then projected into the glass cell. Clayton was reborn as a holographic projection, but this wasn't a good thing for him. Cruelly, Mr. Rolo also simulated the electric chair. He pulled the lever repeatedly, making Clayton experience the pain of electrocution over and over. After testing, it was determined that the electrocution couldn't last longer than 15 seconds. Otherwise, Clayton's consciousness would be permanently deleted. Once the testing was complete, Mr. Rolo's Black Museum opened. Visitors flocked to the museum, and many pulled the lever to electrocute Clayton for fun. Each time Clayton was electrocuted, a keychain with a copy of his consciousness would be produced as a souvenir for the visitors. It was a twisted setup. As Mr. Rolo finished telling the story, his face turned red, and he started coughing, looking incredibly pained. Nish dragged a chair over and ordered him to sit down. She pointed out that he left out a crucial detail. Clayton's wife later protested, causing the number of visitors to the museum to dwindle. Eventually, only sadists and racists frequented the museum, and Mr. Rolo had to rely on this income to keep the museum running. Over time, even the sadists lost interest, and the museum became deserted. One day, Clayton's wife visited the museum, and seeing her husband tortured like a submissive kitten broke her heart. She returned home and swallowed an entire bottle of sleeping pills. It was Nish who found her. It turned out that Nish had spiked the bottled water Mr. Rolo had just drunk, and she had tampered with the air conditioning as well. Clayton was actually her father, and this time the consciousness extractor was placed on Mr. Rolo's head. After 30 seconds, Mr. Rolo died, and when he woke up again, he found himself in the same situation as Carrie, sitting in the Paradise Cinema. Nish had transferred Mr. Rolo's consciousness into the virtual consciousness of her father, Clayton. Furious and frustrated, Mr. Rolo tried to curse, but the holographic projection of Clayton couldn't speak. Nish then pulled the electric switch, causing both Mr. Rolo and Clayton to feel the pain of electrocution. After 15 seconds of agony, they were both finally released from their suffering. Carrie, who was still inside the monkey, watched through the glass window as everything finished. Nish collected a keychain containing Mr. Rolo's consciousness. His pain would now be repeated infinitely. With her revenge complete, Nish left with Carrie, the monkey, and caused a short circuit in the air conditioning system outside. She placed Carrie in the car, which was now fully charged, and looked at Mr. Rolo's consciousness keychain hanging from the rearview mirror. Nish's mother smiled happily and felt proud of her. It turned out that her mother's consciousness had also entered Nish's mind, and they left together, leaving the Black Museum to burn in thick smoke, taking its sins with it. The sixth story, titled Metalhead, begins in a post-apocalyptic world where humanity is dominated by robots built with chat GPT intelligence. A woman named Bella is traveling on the road with her two companions. They chat about pigs and dogs, seemingly metaphorical. They stop near a warehouse, hoping to find some supplies as gifts for a dying child. Their vehicle is low on fuel. The bearded companion decides to deal with a nearby truck, preparing it for their getaway. Bella and another companion enter the warehouse to search for supplies. The bearded man smashes the truck's window with a hammer and finds an electronic device to insert into the truck's control system. He inputs numbers from a code book, attempting to unlock it. Meanwhile, Bella and the companion cautiously enter the dark warehouse. They're looking for a box with a special label. Bella follows the directions, going past a long row of shelves, and finally finds the cardboard box high above. The companion climbs the ladder to retrieve the box, but suddenly discovers a hidden robot dog. The robot dog releases a shotgun blast, scattering tracker-filled fragments into the companion's body. He falls and yells for Bella to run. The robotic dog quickly moves, jumping onto the ladder and then descending. He swings a hook at the dog, but its body is as sturdy as a rock, and it remains unharmed. The dog lifts its paw and shoots him down, then fires a second shot into his head. 
Terrified, Bella frantically runs out of the warehouse towards their vehicle. The robot dog swiftly pursues her. The bearded man finally cracks the truck system and starts driving. He and Bella make separate escapes, with the robotic dog hot on their tails, tracing their hormone smell. Despite its short legs, the dog's speed surpasses that of the vehicle's. It breaks through the window and quickly enters the truck. Raising its paw, it approaches him. Then with a loud bang, the bearded man meets his demise with his messy beard. The robot dog then inserts its front paw into the truck's interface, taking control of the vehicle. It drives the truck, crashing into the back of Bella's car. A fast and furious chase begins between Bella and the robot dog on the highway. Bella's car is forced off the road, crashing into a forest and stopping at the edge of a cliff where she loses consciousness. Bella had been hit by the shrapnel earlier and now has trackers embedded in her body. The robot dog breaks through the door, tracking her down through the GPS signal rather than her stinky body smell. Upon waking, Bella finds herself teetering on the edge of the cliff and nearly falls. The robot dog arrives, breaking the car window and jumping in. Furious, Bella repeatedly kicks the annoying dog, taking advantage of its unstable footing to escape the vehicle. The car rolls off the cliff and crashes at the bottom. Bella flees to a nearby stream, disinfects her wounds with water, and endures the pain of removing the trackers with a knife. Using pliers, she places the trackers in a water bottle and throws it into the rushing river. Let's take a look at the robot dog's side of things. Its front leg got stuck in the car, and while trying to free itself, it broke off a part, leaving it with a limp. However, it remained agile and nimble, running along and detecting the location of the tracker. Upon reaching the tracker, it saw a water bottle and was dumbfounded. Meanwhile, not too far away, Bella was using a walkie-talkie to contact her home. She spoke quite loudly, and the robot dog's audio detection system picked up her location. Unaware of the impending danger, Bella continued talking. After finishing her call, she was about to leave when she suddenly saw the limping dog on a nearby hillside. She knew she couldn't outrun it, so she quickly climbed a tree. The limping dog tried to jump up the tree, and it might have succeeded if it didn't have a limp. After several failed attempts, it decided to rest under the tree. Bella, not daring to come down, stayed in the tree as well. She fell asleep at midnight and nearly slid off the tree, but a tree branch hit the lifeless dog, and it became active again. Fortunately, Bella managed to climb back up the tree using all her strength. To conserve energy, the limping dog went back to sleep. Bella came up with a plan. She took candy from her pocket and threw it onto the dog, waking it up. Seeing the situation, the dog went back to sleep. However, every time it slept for a while, Bella would throw another candy to wake it up. This helped keep her awake and drain the dog's energy. She repeated this process until morning, when the dog didn't wake up after she threw the candy, its battery finally depleted. Bella seized the opportunity to climb down the tree and continue her escape. However, the robot dog was solar-powered, and its energy was gradually recovering. Bella took refuge in a house where there was a car in the yard, but it wouldn't start. She saw a set of keys through a window in the door and, after great effort, managed to hook them out. Meanwhile, the limping dog had fully recharged its battery using solar power and was back on the road with renewed vigor. Unfortunately, the set of keys didn't include a car key, but at least she could open the front door. Bella had no choice but to search the house for the car key, rummaging through drawers without success. She went upstairs and found two decomposed, foul-smelling bodies on a bed who had died from self-inflicted gunshot wounds. She snatched a shotgun from the man's hand and found the car key on his body, getting blood all over her hands. She went to the bathroom to wash up. The limping dog had already followed Bella to the front door of the house. It effortlessly broke into the security system and opened the door. Bella washed her hands, found a first aid kit, and bandaged her legs, preparing to hit the road again. Meanwhile, the limping dog had quietly entered the mansion and made its way to the kitchen. It extended its lame leg and attached a sharp knife to it. Bella finally heard the mechanical sounds of the limping dog. She grabbed the shotgun and peered down the stairs, only to see the grim, reaper-like figure approaching. She quickly hid in another room as the limping dog drew nearer. In a critical moment, she grabbed a bucket of paint and splashed it onto the dog's eyes, blinding it. She threw the bucket against the wall to make noise, and the blind dog, waving its blade, stabbed the wall, creating numerous holes. Bella seized the opportunity to run out of the room and into the car, but the car wouldn't start, and the sound system began playing. The blind, limping dog now relied solely on its hearing. It followed the sound, stabbed a large hole in the car door, and jumped inside, wildly stabbing everywhere. 
Little did it know, Bella had approached it from behind and shot it in the head. But the dog's life force was incredibly tenacious, and it stood up again. Bella hesitated while reloading the shotgun, and the dog stabbed her leg. In pain, she fell to the ground and shot the dog's head once more, causing the creature to be truly finished. Just as Bella was about to leave, a shotgun shell popped out of the dead dog's body, and countless trackers flew into her body. She returned to the bathroom, picked up a knife, but slowly put it down. She felt a tracker in her neck, right next to her carotid artery. Removing it would be suicide, so she took out the walkie-talkie again, choking back tears as she told the person that she wouldn't be able to make it back. She apologized for not retrieving the supplies and held the knife to her neck, taking her own life. Meanwhile, countless robotic dogs were on the move, at the bottom of cliffs and inside warehouses. Their terrifying figures were everywhere. It's revealed that Bella and her companions left their shelter and entered the robot-dominated world with a mission of retrieving a box of teddy bears meant for children, despite the fact that they knew the deadly mission would cost all their shitty lives. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.